Okay, let's look at this landscape. This is from uh, some brochure recommending how you should have your landscape. I don't remember who put it out. Uh, let's have a little show of hands. You can examine it for a minute. Two landscapes here on the left and right. Try not to look at too many of the details, but just the overall feel of the landscapes. Who would rather uh, live uh, in the house with the landscape on the left? Don't look at a house, the landscape. Okay, how about the right? Okay, we had a couple on the right, most on the left. <clears throat> and generally that's, that's what happens when I show this picture. Uh, what is it about the landscape on the left, do you think? Anybody have a maturity. mature trees? What goes along with maturity generally? Shade. Shade. Privacy. Uh, privacy. And I'm thinking size. I mean, big trees are the point of this talk. And, and uh, then think for a second, which do we more <laughs> often recommend, uh, the left or the right? Uh, and what I found is when you look around at extension brochures and, and uh, power company brochures and uh, sometimes uh, National Arbor Day Foundation, lots of other people making recommendations, this landscape on the right ends up being the one we tend to recommend to people. We may not think we are, but I think I'll show in a minute that often that's what we're recommending and yet often Research has shown this is the kind of landscape people like. Now, I'm not talking about the details of that probably being a weeping willow hanging over the house and breaking up the patio and all that, but it's <laughs> big trees versus small. Okay, so uh, the full title of what I'm going to speak about is Importance of Large Trees to Communities and How to Allow for Them, Communities and Neighborhood. And I think there needs to be a renewed emphasis on large trees in our landscapes and actually, after the first time I gave this talk at, uh, I think it was the uh, National Arbor, De uh, Arbor Day Foundation uh, Tree City Conference in Nebraska City, shortly after that I saw somebody here in Oregon, there's an Oregon, I don't know what it's called, Community News or something, mm -hmm. the, the uh, newsletter from State Forestry. Somebody wrote an article on how we need more big trees and landscapes. Is that person here? <laughs> Okay. Anyway, I thought, yeah, right on. And was really advocating for remembering that besides there being a place for small trees and landscapes, we need to make room for big trees. Because you can't duplicate something like this with a crab apple. Um, <laughs> you know, especially in these big, large scale uh, public landscapes like the last couple we've seen here, uh, they're important. This, by the way, is a uh, I think it's called a tabletop elm. I think it's, it's just a cultivar of America, uh, American and some other kind of elm uh, that spreads out. Uh, these big trees, these on the right are, are actually bald cypresses on the river walk in San Antonio, Texas. This is downtown Seattle. And again, what would this place be? without trees. Now maybe on a gray cloudy day, maybe you'd rather not have these, but in the sum summer sun they were great. Even in residential landscapes, I think we need to remember that there's room for big trees if we do the right things. This actually is a residential landscape in Corvallis. And that's a big uh, European hornbeam. Um, this is not a residential landscape, but it's just a great big tree. Uh, scotch pine in a cemetery. Here's a couple of residential landscapes with large trees that the landscapes just wouldn't be the same without large trees. This was across the street from where I lived the year I was in Corvallis. Uh, she didn't mention because I didn't tell her to, but I, w I did a year sabbatical at the College of Forestry at Oregon State, uh, 98 to 99. And uh, got a little bit involved with urban forestry stuff in the state while I was there. I can think that's an Oregon white oak or a couple of them. And what would this residential neighborhood be without this row of pin oaks? This is back in the Midwest in Lincoln, Nebraska. Just think of that landscape if these were gone and how nondescript that neighborhood would be. 
And I'd say even if it was a row of small crab apples, you know, it'd be pretty in the spring, uh, but it just wouldn't quite be the same. So this is a summary of what I'll cover for the rest of this talk, that smaller trees often seem best for restrictions of modern life, and I've listed some restrictions there that I think lead to a tendency to have small trees like liability, a hurry up mentality, hurry up being I couldn't possibly wait for a tree to grow 50 feet tall. I just want my installed landscape to be the way it's going to be now. Uh, cost, uh, especially cost of maintenance of big trees and then lack of space in modern landscapes. Then larger trees often are best for community values it turns out and there are tools to use to try to fit large high quality trees into our communities. And I should say, when I talk about large trees in this talk, I don't have a specific cutoff in mind. And I do mean large maturing trees. I don't mean large when we put them in the ground. I mean large when they grow up. Um, but larger rather than smaller. So some of the landscapes I might show, the trees aren't especially big, especially with West Side Oregon standards, um, but uh, bigger than you could grow if you didn't do the right things. Okay, so smaller trees often are best for the restrictions of modern life. To, uh, this is kind of a description of an ideal community forest uh, glean that I gleaned from going through the literature, how we're <laughs> recommending to people to, to uh, grow trees in our communities. No large trees where cars might hit them. Th these are all advice I've seen where they'll interfere with pavement and curbs and other infrastructure, under overhead utilities, over underground utilities, where they'll interfere with signs, like downtown areas, for example, where they'll hang over a building, where they might pose a hazard to people. Uh, if you talk to some city attorneys, <coughs> this last one, they just assume not have any trees. Um, and when you add it all up, it only amounts to having room for small trees if you have to have trees at all. Um, and these are specific recommendations uh, that I've found in expert literature. So extension, state forestry, uh, power companies, um, nurseries. Large trees should be at least 45 feet from utility lines. Only small trees or no trees under utility lines, and we'll, we'll get into this in a little bit, but the no trees under utility lines seems to be a more recent trend in recommendations. Large trees at least 24 feet from buildings. Plant large trees at least 40 feet apart. No trees at all if a parking strip is less than six feet wide. Actually, there I have some agreement with the problems with narrow parking strips and large trees. Uh, no tree limbs over buildings at all. No trees that will hang over a neighbor's property. And when you add all that up, does anybody in here live in a home with a landscape that you could have a big tree? Uh, if you do, you got a big spread. <laughs> uh, because you add it all up, there just isn't room. Uh, and I think this is it's, it's these kinds of things all added up that end up being why we're recommending that landscape on the right rather than on the left. And usually most, if not all of this, is very well-meaning. Yeah, ideally you wouldn't have a branch hanging over your house. On the other hand, there are, there are reasons to have branches hanging over your house like shade uh, and the fact that if you want a big tree or maybe any tree, you may not have room for a tree if you don't allow for that. Yeah. Why wouldn't you want a branch over your house? Um, it, I assume, I don't remember what brochure this came from, but I assume it came from, I believe this brochure was a long list of don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and they didn't think about what that means, that you couldn't have a landscape hardly. But uh, I assume it was just worry about a branch dying and decaying and falling into the house or something. Uh, I can tell you all the reasons I hear. Uh, a branch over the house um, drops leaves in the gutter. A branch over the house 
shades it and creates moss in the shingles. A branch over the house is a place for critters to jump off into your house and create, you know. I haven't heard that last one, but I've heard the others. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. And others. But I mean, I hear that kind of stuff all the time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'll finish this talk with, in the end, people, in, to a large extent, it's jo the jobs of people like you all to help people get what they want, but it's also somewhat your jobs to help steer them towards, or make them realize what it's okay to want. And, and, uh, uh, and so I think it, there's a case to be made for large trees. In the end, I, the, the neighborhood I lived at in, over in Corvallis was an old Douglas fir stand up in the hills north of town. And there were, there were numerous stumps in this neighborhood. The neighborhood was about 20 years old, well, 25 years old. There were numerous stumps that had been formed since the neighborhood was built of huge Douglas firs removed because they just didn't fit with people living there anymore. And there were still many Douglas firs left. Uh, it was still a what you'd call a wooded neighborhood. Um, but it probably made sense for some of those Doug firs to be removed. Uh, they still had a wooded neighborhood. Um, uh, and to some extent, the types of problems with maintaining large trees may be more of an issue on this side of the mountains than that side of the mountains. The west side is easier to grow a big tree. You almost can't help but grow big trees sometimes because uh, of the availability of water. On this side, it's a lot harder. And where I live in Utah, if you want to grow a big tree, you have to mean to. You really have to try. Um, but certainly there are reasons to, to do either. This is an example of uh, what I think is taking the right tree, right place idea with uh, it, regarding trees and power lines a little too far. I don't know. This is from somebody's website, and I don't know who, but it's an uh, electric utility. And they've gone to the extent of saying a no tree zone within 25 feet of power lines at all. So they're not saying only small trees there, they're saying no trees there. And this is where I got the large trees, a large tree being 40 feet in height, which is large but not huge, um, at least 60 feet from power lines. Uh, so um, I don't know, this to me, especially the no trees under power lines at all, or within 25 feet seems to be taken it a little far. And you could end up with landscapes like this, and actually this landscape when it grows up is gonna, isn't going to follow some of those rules. Because <laughs> you're going to have branches over the house, you're going to have branches over the neighbor's house. Uh, at least there aren't any utilities evident here. And I, either of these landscapes wouldn't be viable given all those rules I listed. Um, uh, too much, too many branches hanging over the house there, and obviously that tree's a menace. Uh, <laughs> that's in Corvallis. <laughs> At least when that one goes down, it's going to be kind of soft as it <laughs> eases into the house. Okay, um, the next point. Larger trees are often best for community values. The, uh, an ideal community forest as expressed by people living in the communities could be summed up as, and I'll show the research behind this in a minute, but uh, people have been asked, what do you like about streetscapes and about uh, lawns and, and yards? And they like shady streets lined with large trees with wide canopies meeting over the street. That's kind of an ideal community forest look that people like. Large shade trees along with small flowering trees. They don't mind small trees, but they want them as some punctuation in the landscape, not as the only thing. Uh, views of natural features. That natural, not necessarily uh, there because of nature. It could be planted, but they like green and they like trunks of trees and such, but they don't want to see utilities. They, they actually, if you show them a landscape, uh, with houses, they'd even kind of rather not see the houses. Now there's lots of exceptions because, uh, and I don't think it's been studied, but older people, for example, quite old, uh, often will start to not like really heavily wooded landscapes, security worries and, and maintenance issues. 
Um, but by and large, people like these things. Um, hidden utilities I mentioned, and trees providing maximum environmental benefit. And here are some specific studies where these things were established, and there are others as well. So this citation is in the Journal of Arboriculture, Volume 9. In Ohio, uh, people were asked about the aesthetics of a streetscape and, f and rated a, a high aesthetically large trees, shady trees hiding the house, and low aesthetically small trees, buildings, utility poles and wires in plain view. And actually a lot of us would probably rate it the same. In Michigan, large street trees preferred over small trees. And these are studies where people actually looked at landscapes and rated them. In Chicago, larger street trees were desired and nobody in this particular study felt that a tree could be too big. And then another Forest Service report that, that uh, described where people described liking tall street trees and creating an enclosed space. So people like these kinds of landscapes. This is kind of that ideal look. Uh, this is actually in Utah, and uh, it's uh, those are London Plains. And this is in southern Utah in a little town uh, by Capitol Reef National Monument. But this town, there's more than one person that's almost gotten run over just like me by parking <laughs> and stopping and taking a picture of this streetscape. These aren't the best, this, not the best species here, but nevertheless, people like it. So, although a lot of people, including many of you, but including many of the people in those studies, what they describe tends to be more like this. I think this is often what's being recommended. And there are aspects to this that make a lot of sense, <coughs> and some people may like it more than this. Um, but I think uh, we need to try to make, realize that people do like big trees, and help make room for them. Uh, larger trees, it turns out, also provide greater benefits than small trees, often in terms of uh, the environment. Yeah. I'm just curious of these, these surveys of people. Well, first of all, a lot of those are 20 years old or older. And a lot of them, if you notice, are in the Midwest. Too. Yes. But when, when you're surveying people on community values like that, is there a, a chance that there's a real divergence between what people like in their community and what they like in their yard? Because a, as a landscape contractor doing a lot of maintenance work, I found nobody wanted what they had this vision of a high maintenance yard being, even though they paid somebody else to take care of it. And large trees fit into that vision of a high maintenance yard because they have leaves or things fall off of them or something. And so they, they might like it as a high value for their community, but they don't want to deal with it at home. Yeah, these studies tended to focus on streetscapes, which by their nature are more public. And I suppose maybe people would look on that as landscapes they're less likely to have to take care of. Uh, although at least the last two places I've lived, Nebraska and Utah, both states, uh, the trees in the public right of way in front of residences by law usually have to be cared for by the person owning the residence. There's some gray area there, but uh, I don't know about in Oregon. I suspect it might be the same in Oregon that a lot of cities expect at least that the adjacent homeowner will take care of those trees. Uh, so th there's fairly limited uh, it's fairly limited in what you can say from those studies. Uh, I didn't really come across studies talking to people about trees in their yards, for example, uh, explicitly. They tended to focus on street trees. Yeah. Seems like that society in general, whether it's our national forests or there are trees at home, everybody wants to save a tree, but they still use toilet paper. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> wants everybody to save a tree in their yard, but they don't want to clean up the mess in their own yard. They don't even realize how critical it would be. Yeah, and and studies like this too aren't saying aren't giving trade-offs. They're not saying, do you like this? Do you mind that your city is going to spend ten thousand dollars to clean up? I don't know, clean leaves out of the gutters or something. Um, there are studies that have done that, but they're very few. Mostly, um, 
studies tend to be slanted towards proving that people think trees are great. I've actually tried to get funding to do studies to try to find out what people don't like about trees and it's often hard to get those kinds of studies funded because the people, well, ISA in particular, I mean, trees are great. That's their slogan, you know, and trees are great, uh, but we all know there are things people don't like about trees. Um, if you don't understand what people don't like about them, then you have trouble convincing them to do otherwise. Yeah. Nevertheless, I think there's still a case to be made for big trees, especially in public landscapes, where I think sometimes we almost have a duty because in some places it's the only place where we have room for a big old oak and where maybe there's the will to keep a tree growing for 60 years to have a big tree. Um, private landscapes, I'm very much of the opinion people should be able to get what they want. Public private landscapes, those landscapes like along streets in fronts of homes in neighborhoods, those bridge between people ought to get what they want for their neighborhood or in front of their home, but at the same time there's some community values that are bigger than what they want. Okay, here's some examples of uh, uh, some environmental benefits, especially that large trees provide much better than small trees. Um, for example, energy savings, all these things, shade, wind reduction, evaporative cooling, generally the bigger the tree, the more you get, um, or at least the more canopy cover you get, the more you get uh, benefit. Uh, the shade makes pavement last longer, uh, so the more you shade pavement, the longer it'll last. Um, pollution mitigation, most of what trees do uh, for pollution mitigation, like taking up fine particulates from the air, the, the more crown you've got, the more uptake you're going to have. Stormwater runoff reduction, big crowns intercept big amounts of water and release it slowly over time or much of it never makes it to the ground, it evaporates away so you can reduce the amount of stormwater retention you need in places that need that. I'm not sure Redmond would need a lot of that or not. You get eight and a half inches of precip per year, I think. Um, uh, trees also have a greater visual, big trees also have greater visual impact uh, if they're especially well cared for. Um, traffic calming, there are studies now that have shown that Large trees uh, near a roadway will actually cause traffic to slow down because people sense that they're going faster than if there weren't large trees near to the roadway. I think that came out of uh, University of Washington, Seattle. Of course, uh, well-maintained trees uh, can increase property values, big trees sometimes more so, and then big trees absorb more carbon in their bodies than small trees. There's a good website, the Center for Urban Forest Research, that summarizes a lot of the values of both big and small trees. A lot of this stuff like the uh, pollution mitigation, stormwater reduction, so on. Okay, finally, let's talk about some of the tools to fit large, high-quality trees into communities, into landscapes. What's working against having large trees? Then we can see what we can do to, to uh, work uh, to make it better. Small planting areas are obvious problems uh, when when we uh, want to have large trees, especially I think narrow parking strips. Uh, utilities, especially overhead electric utilities, uh, sometimes get in the way. Uh, misconceptions, I think there's some misconceptions people have about small versus big trees, poor selection, and then some legitimate concerns, and I'll go over each of these. So what can we do for small planting areas? Well, uh, especially for narrow parking strips, uh, uh, we can just make more room. And it seems obvious, but it's uh, recently I think things have started to turn around, at least some communities I've seen where parking strips are becoming wider uh, by uh, zoning ordinances. Um, and the whole idea is to make more room for roots and trunks. Uh, and we'll go over each of these one at a time so I won't read through them. Okay, how much soil volume do you need to grow a tree? 
Uh, nobody's really done long-term controlled studies to find out how much soil, good soil rooting volume you need to grow a 20 inch diameter tree. Uh, uh, research funding cycles don't go long enough to grow a 20, 220 inch trees to see what they need. But trees have been excavated, root systems have been excavated, and these are some people's best estimates based on research they've done. If you ever get a chance, root around in the old arboriculture literature, uh, Tom Perry, Thomas Perry was at North Carolina State, I think he's dead now, but he did some a couple of great articles summarizing how tree roots grow, where they grow. He actually lifted up pavers and pavement and found where roots were, had diagrams and photographs, really good stuff. But he estimated that a 20 inch diameter tree, trunk diameter, needed a 40 foot by 40 foot area, that's 1600 square feet, uh, or about 80 to 120 cubic feet of soil per inch of trunk diameter. And uh, uh, 1,600 square feet, uh, if you think of it being, that's if you think of it being a foot deep. If you think of it being two feet deep, you could have a smaller area. One problem with assuming you can go really deep with the root system is, depending on compaction, uh, the soil type and so on, you may not have a very usable uh, rooting area below a foot to two feet deep. Uh, Nina Bassick at Cornell has estimated two cubic feet of soil per square foot of crown area. Uh, James Urban, landscape architect who does a lot of hardcore urban tree plantings uh, in the Baltimore and Washington DC area. He's worked with trees on the U.S. Mall. Uh, estimates a foot and a half, uh, 1.5 cubic feet of soil per square foot of crown area, or about 60 cubic feet <coughs> per inch of trunk diameter. So he's a little on the low end here, Perry's a little on the high end, and Urban also mentions uh, that parking strips should be at least four feet wide. Now I just wanted to try this out, I've got a bunch of old photos of excavated tree root systems from research studies that were done long ago. This is an apple tree dug up in uh, England. And uh, I put the, they actually suspended the tree and distributed the root system out about the way it was when it was dug up. And it was a root system about two feet deep. This tree had about a six inch diameter trunk. The root system was about 16 feet wide, I'm estimating it, by about two feet deep. When you add that up, it comes to about 400 cubic feet, which is about 67 cubic feet of per inch of trunk diameter. So 67 cubic feet of soil and root system volume per inch of trunk diameter, which is right about at uh, what we were seeing. Oh, I'm trying to go the other way. 67 versus uh, urban 60, Perry's 80 to 120. So I think those are good ballpark figures, somewhere between 60 and 120 cubic feet of good soil volume, meaning uh, soil that roots can grow in, uh, not super compacted road base, not a school playground, <laughs> typical school playground. Uh, you'd have to adjust for those things. Okay, require wider parking strips. This is another thing that can be done and I think is being done more often. Two to three feet is common in a lot of landscapes that were built in the 60s, 70s uh, for parking strips. Um, but now I think a lot of communities are coming around. Often they're seeing that moving the sidewalk back in towards a home in a residential neighborhood and having a wider parking strip doesn't necessarily mean the builder gets less homes per, per acre. It just means you're redistributing where the sidewalk is and maybe there's more uh, public right of way there to have the wider parking strip, but you can still have uh, the number of homes they would like to have. Mountain View, California, I found interesting. I did a Google search minimum parking strip width uh, just for fun and came up with this uh, in their zoning ordinances. A curbside planting strip 10 feet in width shall be established to create a boulevard appearance, establishing adequate planting area 
for large scale species of shade trees and provide additional buffering for residences. Now that assumes the residence has moved farther back. Um, Logan, where I live, the minimum now is eight feet. We have some old landscapes in town, uh, like 80 years old, that used to have 12 to 15 foot parking strips. Um, but eight foot is now the standard. In the neighborhood I live in that was built in the 70s, uh, two feet, two, two feet to 30 inches was the standard. And there's big trees in those strips, and you can imagine the problems, uh, including in front of my house. Uh, Syracuse, Utah, a kind of up-and-coming uh, bedroom community for Salt Lake is now in their new developments requiring a 10-foot minimum parking strip. Eugene, Oregon encourages meandering sidewalks, which is another way in, zone, in areas anyway to widen the parking strip to make some room, um, especially for established big trees. So this is that town in northern Utah with about a 10 foot wide parking strip. You might wonder what this little con concrete trench is and this is an old irrigation ditch. Uh, Utah there, are irrigation ditches are everywhere and that's been in a long time. But these London Plains um, are established on both sides of this street with those wide parking strips and this neighborhood just wouldn't be the same on a busy federal highway were it not for those wide strips allowing for big trees and uh, kind of a nice buffer for the neighbor. This is a landscape in downtown Salt Lake City uh, with another wide parking strip. Now these aren't huge trees, but they're bigger than you could grow if you had a two or three foot parking strip, or worse if you had a sidewalk up against the curb. And this is at a hotel called Little America. Little America started in western Wyoming in a treeless uh, desert and they were known for their first hotel just being surrounded by uh, dense tree plantings and they've done it here in Salt Lake City too. And this is from Google Earth, that's where I took that picture looking this way uh, and this is from a little farther out, look at this kind of mini sea of green and <laughs> not much green around, this is the city county building here but Anyway, it really makes a difference, makes that a much more pleasant place to be. Here's a nice parking lot b buffer between a parking lot and a sidewalk, uh, probably uh, seven or eight feet wide in downtown Omaha, Nebraska, uh, where these aren't huge trees, uh, but these are much bigger trees than you could grow if you hadn't, hadn't left that kind of room and probably healthier than you would be growing them otherwise. Uh, the meandering sidewalk idea I mentioned, this isn't a great picture, but this is from Eugene, Oregon's uh, planning website. And here where they probably had to redo a sidewalk and cut some roots, they've uh, jogged to the sidewalk to the left. This one happens to be right in front of an entrance to a building uh, to allow some more room. So it's, it's a wider park, uh, parking strip in a small area. And uh, rubber sidewalks, along with meanders, uh, are a new, somewhat new idea. There's a company called, I don't know the name of the company, but their website is rubbersidewalks.com. Um, and they sell these panels, I think they're two inch thick, and uh, you place them uh, around root systems like this where you have existing trees you're trying to save, uh, not having to cut down into root systems as much especially if you meander it out like that and uh, allow some flexibility, uh, try to avoid having to grind sidewalks and this is a replacement of what was here. Uh, sometimes the best idea would be if you don't have room to get a big tree on the other side of a sidewalk in a residential area on the property owner's side. Now I've had it said by cities we can't do that. We can't have a public tree on private property. And a couple of ways this has been solved is in Sacramento, they've established tree planting easements where they have an easement in some cases on the property owner side of the sidewalk and it allows them to put public trees in and retain ownership of them. Uh, presumably this was something where homeowners wanted this and agreed to it, I don't know. Um, 
in, in another case, in this case actually, where these green ashes had to come out and the curb and sidewalk had to be replaced in this neighborhood, uh, the solution that they came up with was to provide the trees but put them on, the, on private property and then the city was done with them. They were the private property owners, trees to take care of. Parking bays and planting, alternating with planting strips. It's just the idea of bumping a curb out to get some space, uh, but then bumping it back in to, to maintain some parking. And I think it can be especially useful in downtown areas and where you have businesses, storefronts, and don't have enough room for a really wide parking, stri uh, parking strip. And if you go to Eugene, Oregon's website, eugene-or.gov, um, you can find this. Uh, it's in their street tree plan. They say large-scale deciduous canopy trees are preferred for street tree plantings. They're requiring a seven-foot parking strip and up to eight and a half to nine and a half ideal. Uh, but that's where I found these diagrams of parking bays and planting strips. Now this is one from on end, but you can see how there's some parking in line with uh, uh, landscape. This happens to have a median that may or may not be planted. But here it is from above, having room for two or three cars and then bumping out a parking strip and having enough room with the seven foot minimum width that you have enough room for a tree or two, a, a big tree. They don't have to be small trees and I might argue that actually a big tree is more appropriate for this setting because small trees will cause visual obstructions. And they're saying here the planting strip should be a minimum 200 square feet to allow adequate tree root growth. Um, but in reality what the roots, if you get trees this big, it's going to be because roots are growing under the sidewalks, possibly under the streets, not just within that parking strip. Porous pavements to allow more effective rooting volume. Uh, so uh, pavements that have openings and cracks to allow oxygen especially and water to get down into the soil to make a en rooting environment that's effective. Um, these are uh, brick pavers in a landscape in a downtown in uh, downtown Omaha, Nebraska. A park on this side, a sidewalk, and then pavers uh, that were really very effective uh, and probably once installed uh, from what I've seen with this landscape, not much more headache and probably less headache than if they tried to maintain a lawn there. Uh, and after five years I came back and these trees had about doubled in diameter and were doing great. And there wasn't a lot of evidence of uh, failure of the trees or having to, to do major maintenance with the pavers. <coughs> are those pavers like made of um, rock? These are bricks. Uh, I, I think they're old uh, bricks from places in downtown Omaha where they had been stripping up old <coughs> brick streets and then uh, using those pavers for this, because these look old, they don't look new. But the idea would be the same even if they were new modern pavers. And it doesn't matter brick or stone or uh, concrete pavers, but the idea of having gaps between pieces. I'm really uh, down on high-tech tree pits. The more high-tech, the less I like it, because Often high-tech means very expensive for one thing and very inflexible, hard to maintain. Uh, these are across the street from these, right here, matter of fact, at the base of this big glass and plastic building. And uh, these, this tree's gone because it already died. They probably forgot to uh, figure out how they're going to water it. These are cantilevered concrete panels, a two-piece panel that sit on a ledge and I don't know how they ever thought they were going to do anything for maintenance for these trees. I assume they had some kind of triple irrigation system underneath. Uh, these are more of those at least with a little bit bigger cutouts but these trees were dying. All the trees on that side of the street died and the trees with just the pavers didn't. Now they may not have had a lot of rooting space here and there are issues, uh, there are ways you can overcome that with structural soils Sometimes you just you just pick the right tree 
have enough soil volume and uh, and you can you can do it. This is an example of that. These are very low tech pits. Um, there is soil probably to about here under the sidewalk and then from here over these buildings had basements kind of like the Seattle Underground where it's kind of bumped out underneath the sidewalk. Um, but there was some rooting volume more than you're just seeing with this pit. These are at grade, no iron grates. I don't know if they had iron grates at one time, but I, I like not having them because I think often they're, they're too expensive and they provide as much tripping hazard as this does uh, when they're not maintained. These are hackberries, by the way. Uh, you've seen a little bit of drought effect there. Um, uh, it probably helps these trees that out under the streets are those old cobblestone, well, not cobblestone, but brick pavers, because um, they can root out under those streets. I think the low tech, the, the more low tech, the better when it comes to tr tree pits. Grates, as I said, are inexpensive, are expensive and inflexible. You need to be able to get access to the soil volume under the pavement. The, the trees need to. It's hardly any tree of any size that's going to survive in a small cutout in the pavement. Water is the main limiting factor often, uh, so you need to get water down to them. And sometimes it's just a matter of picking the appropriate species. Tree guards to guard the pits, especially in high density urban areas where you're likely to get garbage or bicycles being parked, these types of things uh, can be useful. Sometimes there's guards that go up the trees to protect the trunk of the tree itself. I've got less problem with those than I do the tree grades. And there's an interesting article at treesnewyork.com where they talk about these tree pit guards that they've had success with. But here's the ultimate in low-tech tree pits, a tree grown out of the street. Um, with just a little bit of where they kept the pavement away from it. Now, this is a big old oak, I don't know what kind, in Solvang, California. Uh, they're hardly doing anything for it. I'm not saying to plant trees in the middle of the street, but, <coughs> but I don't think you need to go to this extent. Now this is in New York, or I mean Washington, D.C., uh, near the mall. Uh, very high-tech uh, landscape, still just pavers, loose laid pavers, probably on sand. And, and I like this landscape, it's a successful landscape, um, but to spend, I, don't, I couldn't find a price on this tree, tree grate, but I know a very simple rectangular tree grate without these ridges can go up to a couple thousand bucks. So this has to be many, many thousands of dollars, and there were many of these. And you can see, uh, it wasn't doing away with tripping hazard. Uh, it was starting to cause one, actually, yeah. Sure, those ridges are meant to be cut away over the years. Yeah. Maybe so, although they were, I, I think they're more an aesthetic thing because uh, the metal's actually thicker right there than it is elsewhere. But yeah, you, you certainly, they should have cut, cut this out. But if you had, open ground and maybe a little ivy like the New York picture, think of how much more landscaping you could do for the money. Because <laughs> I'm sure the pit preparation in this grate cost way, way more than the trees did. Just the grate probably cost as much as the tree. This isn't too bad here, although these pavers are laid in, in cement mortar, and so you're not quite getting as much benefit. You'll still get a lot of cracks and some oxygen moving down through but better to have loose laid pavers if possible. Uh, I, I like this. Uh, these are these kind of concrete slab pavers that were used in a neighborhood north of the mall in Washington, D.C. And I really like this. Uh, this neighborhood had lots of these plantings at the base of trees. Now these aren't big trees, but any tree in this situation is, is going to be a challenge to grow. And uh, certainly, I think you got a better chance when you have something like this with some pavers than when you have small cutouts like this. This is in downtown Denver. Look at that. That's not a power pole. That's a tree. And the only thing they got going for them is, is it's a honey locust. And I've seen honey locusts survive in one foot square cutouts in a concrete sidewalk. So. Uh, maybe it'll survive a while, or 
Well, actually, this is not the same tree as that. It's the same area, but that's an oak. This is a honey locust. This is another one in that same area, a little bit uh, different area in, in downtown Denver. Amazing the trees surviving. It's a London plain, and they're pretty good at surviving some pretty poor soil conditions. But still, uh, I don't think that's a great situation for the tree. I liked this when I first saw it, but I didn't understand what all was going on. I didn't like how they have the tree guide here. Uh, but they were trying to create a walkable landscape, place where you could have tables, where you can have nice big trees eventually. But if they did this like the next landscape, they'll never have big trees. This is a landscape that was put in where I work. And originally they were going to put Lombardi poplars in, but we convinced them at least to use ginkgos instead of poplar, Lombardi poplars. But then they went ahead installing it, and they put down what's essentially road base, gravel and fines mixed, rolled it and compacted it, then chiseled holes out big enough to put root balls in, put the trees in the holes. They already had the irrigation system and lights installed. You can see a light there. These are where irrigation heads are. And then they took a plate compactor and actually compacted right up to the trunks and I think actually added a little more road base if, if the root ball kind of sunk down in when they compacted it so they could have it level and then skimmed over the whole thing with what I called gravel at a meeting and was promptly corrected that this was pea stone. Um, <laughs> And we question this landscape and the installation, and we're told that they do this all the time, and it works all the time. Uh, the trees have started dying uh, in their first growing season. This coming year is the second growing season, and we'll see. So that's not a way to provide <laughs> adequate rooting space. Now, there are ways to pave and have walkable surfaces and still have rooting volume. I think the jury's still out on this a little, but the idea is structural soils where you have a, a rock lattice that can be compacted fully. It's sharp stone, uh, and it's all pretty uniform in size, so you end up getting gaps in it that you then fill with fine soil, and that's where the roots grow. And it was developed at Cornell University called CU Soil, Amarec.com is their licensor for it, and it's quite expensive, 28 to $35 a cubic yard as of a couple of years ago, plus considerable shipping. Uh, you, you have somebody local make it up for you under license. But the idea is sharp stone that when you compact it, because the sharp angles bridge over gaps, and the gaps are filled with fine soil. Often I think there's a sticker involved like polyacrylamide that actually helps hold the soil in at first. Um, that's the idea of structural soil. To provide a little more rooting volume under pavement than you otherwise would have. And this is a structural soil installation all the way under this sidewalk. Uh, luckily again these are honey locusts so they probably have a leg up anyway. They're probably going to survive in this setting. Uh, but the structural soil will help. That's in Pocatello, Idaho. Some other things that can be done. We, t we just talked about small park planting areas and how to allow for more rooting volume. Um, utilities sometimes cause problems for trees and trees for utilities. And there are answers. Directional pruning and then also sometimes you can place utilities away or you can bury them. That's one, the thing that often comes up when there's problems with utilities. Directional pruning is a way of pruning out branches that go towards the lines and leaving branches that go away from them. It has aesthetic problems, but at least it main t allows maintenance of large crowns of, for large species of trees when, when it's not desirable to remove them. Utilities would rather, in the most cases, remove the large trees but in some cases, like this streetscape with these large, fairly large hackberries, it allowed this municipal utility to maintain the trees and still uh, keep the lines clear. This is that same uh, city, Lincoln, Nebraska, and there's actually poles going right down this street. The lines are right overhead. 
but you'd hardly know it in this view. They've even gone as far as sometimes deciding uh, when they've had to do construction and removal that they'll, they're willing in Lincoln to uh, replant along these busy arterial streets with large maturing species, which is a no-no in the right tree, right place concept. And they've replanted and uh, these trees are just now getting up after 12 years after that previous slide uh, to where they are starting to need directional pruning now. Uh, finally, I mentioned there are some misconceptions, I think, like the idea that small trees fit better in small planting strips, uh, that large trees are unacceptably dangerous, and that you can educate people into liking or preferring small trees, even though they might, on the face of it, prefer large trees. Small trees are not, you see advice all the time saying small planting area, especially a small parking strip, put in a small tree. It's almost always bad advice because you rarely, with a small tree, small maturing tree, can get the crown up high enough for the garbage truck, the cars, the pedestrians, uh, and uh, where we are, the snow plows. We need a 16 foot clearance over the street for plows in my town. Uh, you'll never get that with these trees. You'll get it, but you'll get it by the plow taken off the edges of the crown. So small trees are not the answer for these situations. Large trees don't have to be unacceptably dangerous if they're well selected, good species, and they're well cared for. Yeah, there are some nasty trees in this landscape when you look close, especially if you think, oh, that's probably a weeping willow. This one's a big willow growing up into the uh, service drive for that house. Um, but if that was a big oak, uh, I might say, hey, you know, it's okay. Um, you need good selection. Obviously, this is not a good, good selection for that site. But these are good big trees that are appropriate for the landscape, scaled well, and are high quality. Yeah. Can you go back to that next slide for just one second? Because we get a lot of this in the bins. That tree there, that is obviously a little bit too close. <laughs> but people don't realize that the closer the tree is to the house, the less damage it could possibly do in a storm or something like that. Also meaning if you have a branch over your house and it's fairly close but far enough away that farmers can't jump onto it, then hmm. if it does break, it doesn't get up enough speed and, and velocity to never the house. Well, I never thought of it. Well, there's many trees off of houses. The ones that are about three quarters of the height of the tree away from the house, like your neighbor's tree. Have a lot of momentum. A lot of momentum <laughs> and a lot of speed. If um, the tree was to blow over on the house, what, how do you think it could blow up? That yeah, that tree is unlikely to blow over on that house. It can't blow over. <laughs> that, that big branch can't fall and damage the house. It's too close to the house. This happens to be a bad selection, too. It's a silver maple. Uh, pretty yeah, weak wood. That's a yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. But yeah. the physics. <laughs> Good point. And then... Uh, poor selection. Sometimes big trees have gotten a bad rap because bad species have gone in. And I think uh, that's where a lot of the concern comes from. And too often people are pushing for those fast growing big trees when we should be pushing them to plant medium growth rate or even slow growing trees. Whoever lives under these uh, globe Navajo willows, I'm sure, does not have a real appreciation for big trees. because. Uh, those are the nastiest trees that grow in Utah. They look pretty from afar, uh, but when you see the slime flux and the you know, housefly size aphids, uh, they're nasty. Uh, so better selection would go a long ways towards encouraging planting of large trees. And then I think sometimes we need to remember, for some people, especially in their own yard, you know, they ought to get what they want. And if they prefer smaller trees, don't want the mess, whatever, Maybe that's what they ought to get. That's a royal palm in uh, Santa Barbara, California. When you consider some of the problem species, you know, obviously willows and elms. And things. I know less here. I, I did spend a year living in a Willamette Valley. Um, I, I gathered that uh, isn't big leaf maple kind of a problem over there? Isn't it kind of silver maple-ish? Fairly weak wooded. on your opinion. I don't know. I, I know people who love them and people who hate them. Okay. Yeah. I like them in Eugene Yeah. But then I grew up in Syracuse, New York, and I love silver maples, too. My house has 
had one very large one and now has three very large ones around it. And they're doing very well. I liked silver maples a lot when I was growing up. There's a lot of them in Omaha, Nebraska, and it's native there. I, I really would like to see a lot more oaks going in in general, and I think that's an appropriate recommendation for parts of Oregon as well, especially the right oaks. Uh, it just all depends on your situation, but I hardly ever recommend a fast-growing tree, because fast-growing trees almost always have weak wood. They put very little <coughs> into protecting themselves. They put very little energy into uh, decay-resistant hardwood, very little energy into protecting themselves from insects and diseases, and therefore they tend to be the trees that are problem prone. Um, and I think there are so many species that if a person would not gripe for 10 years about, oh, I don't want to plant a slow growing tree, it'll take forever to grow. Had they planted it when they started griping, they'd have a big tree. Um, <laughs> or, you know, the start of a reasonable sized tree. There's hardly anybody who plants a fast growing tree around their house uh, or in a busy park or something that ends up happy with it 20 years down the road because they just have so many problems. Willows and cottonwoods are the classic ones that come to mind. Uh, I think they're great trees out along the river and out in the backwoods. You know. I also notice a lot of people say, oh, that tree's slow growing, but they don't realize what kind of environment they're putting the tree in. Mm -hmm. It's not the tree that's so slow growing. Slow growing is the environment and the, and the lack of maintenance. I mean, if you're going to put it in a urban setting, you need a lot of water to it, like you were saying. Water and issue. adequate rooting space. Yeah, that you do. Yeah. Uh, another comment uh, around here, reflective feed is I mean, probably one of the biggest killer of trees. Um, you can walk around the fairgrounds and anytime you see a piece of pavement and look at the tree on the north side of that, I mean, like you can see some sun skull over there. The north side? The north side? Or south side? I'm oh, sorry, south side of the tree, north side yeah. of the tree. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Um, and uh, it seems like, I mean, uh, I guess I'm kind of surprised that that wasn't talked about because it seems like we're here, that's one of the biggest issues with planting close to a street. Yeah, and we get that in Utah too, uh, especially Salt Lake South, not so much up where I live in Logan. I often tend to think of a lot of the species that do that the worst as being less desirable species. I'm thinking of four hot, dry landscapes, so like lindens especially. Lindens get it really bad, and they're just not the best trees for those kinds of situations, you know. Uh, uh, that's where something like an oak can be a much more appropriate species. Um, uh, but that's a good point. Uh, uh, and having some adequate space around the tree, I think, can help. Uh, like, I'm guessing those planting uh, boxes, kind of, with the flowers or the ivy in them that you saw in the DC pictures, probably help reduce, uh, if trunks are being hit by sun, probably lower temperature a little bit. We probably ought to let you go to your break, but I'll be around and then I'm speaking again at four. So.